All right. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm sorry I don't have a webcam, so you're not going to be able to see me. But uh, we will be discussing solid state physics today. Uh, this is what I do for fun. Um, so yeah, what is solid state physics? Well, it's the study of solids, the physics inside of solids, and solids are everywhere. Heads up, we can see like the like the border around your slides as well. You can see a border around my slides as well. It's, it's not just showing the slides, it's showing like next slide and stuff. Maybe, um... Oh, can I... Is it not in presentation now? It's like, in a weird view. <laughs> Hmm. Oh. Display settings, maybe? Huh. Okay. Um, geez. Uh, I think if you put it in presentation mode, there's a button you can click to... Uh, yeah, go to, go to slideshow at the top. Yeah. Oh, wait. Go to slideshow at the top. Okay. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. And then... <coughs> Present online? No? Yeah. Mm, um, I think, no. No, no, no. If you just click from current slideshow, it is. Is this too weird or is it like, okay? I mean, it's fine. It's okay. just like, yeah, I guess. All right. I'll just try clicking the button um, on, on the bottom. Um, if you can see the slides fine, then I mean, it's not really. Yeah, I think it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Let's continue. Yeah. So yeah. So solids are everywhere. Um, so there are crystals, diamonds, and the like uh, that have very, very interesting properties. You have semiconductors used inside of chips um, whose behavior can only really be explained with quantum mechanics and uh, form really the bedrock of much of modern society. Uh, I have a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge. It's made out of metals. Uh, why metals behave the way they do is uh, a matter of solid state physics. Uh, this is a light emitting diode, uh, an LED. Um, I remember, I believe, when I was in 11th grade, the Nobel Prize in Physics went to the, pers to the researchers who invented the light-emitting diode. And uh, that was one of the great breakthroughs of uh, modern physics. So a better understanding of the physics of solids and how we can exploit and manipulate their physical properties allows us to develop better materials and better technologies that we can use in everyday life. Uh, all of these things here, uh, photovoltaic cells, MRI machines, magnetic levitation trains, hard disks, these are all um, great advancements uh, made from solid state physics. Uh, a lot of the technologies inside them are great advancements made from solid state physics. By the way, can all of you see this laser pointer? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, but really, that's not the real reason why we study solid state physics. Um, the real reason why we study it is because it's interesting. It's interesting physics. Um, and it's incredibly complicated. So in physics, we have something called the two body problem and the three body problem. So if you just have two bodies with some kind of force in between them, you know, you have the earth and the moon, or you have the sun and the earth, and you know those forces you can, um, you can solve for the motion of those bodies very well. But the moment you have three bodies, you have, say, the sun, the earth, and the moon, it becomes impossible to solve. Inside of a material, uh, you have a really, really large amount of atoms. You know, if you know Avogadro's number, you have something like an Avogadro's number of atoms and that many electrons, too. Um, and even more important, and, and also importantly, we know that the physics of atoms and electrons is described by quantum mechanics. Electrons behave like waves. Um, and what happens when we bring, you know, 10 to the power 23 of these waves and atoms together? What new quantum mechanics do we get? And how can we exploit that in everyday usage? Well, one of the main uh, properties that we care about in materials is their electric properties. And uh, broadly speaking, we can uh, break materials up into conductors and insulators. 
where conductors allow an electric current to flow through them and insulators do not. Um, and this electric current is the actual physical movement of electric charges. And when I say electric charges, I normally mean electrons. When we have a current, you know, here we have a battery hooked up to a, uh, a circuit. We can think of this as sort of being analogous to uh, a very tall tank of water. And the water in this tank has a very high gravitational potential. And if I open up a pipe at the bottom, then the water will want to go to a region of lower energy. Similarly, a battery essentially pumps electrons, pumps charges into an area of high electric potential energy. And putting in the circuit uh, allows those electrons to try to fall to a region of lower energy. And in doing so, they shed their energy through the circuit. How do they shed their energy? Well, again, imagine in a pipe of water, if I have a region where the pipe is very constricted, then this will reduce the amount of water that's flowing through and the water will lose a lot of its energy in passing through there. Similarly, if I put a resistor in a circuit, um, that will, uh, a stronger resistance will lead to a lower amount of current uh, and energy will be dissipated through there. And that leads us to what we call Ohm's law. The current, I, is proportional to the voltage, the energy difference across the battery, just like the height of this tank of water, and inversely proportional to the resistance. If resistance is greater, the current is smaller. If resistance is smaller, the current is bigger. Um, and I guess we know Ohm's law more generally in this form, V is equal to IR, uh, it's the same thing. So how do conductors conduct electricity? Well, this is a periodic table. Um, it contains all of the elements that we know. Um, and roughly we know that these materials uh, are metals. These few materials we call semiconductors and these materials are non-metals. Um, metals allow an electric current to be passed through them and non-metals do not. And semiconductors we'll get to a little bit later. So how do they conduct electricity? Well, uh, you should remember from previous lectures that inside atoms, electrons have certain specific allowed energies that we call energy levels. Um, and if you've taken chemistry, you know that these electrons are found in what we call shells. Um, when we put a lot of metal atoms together, the electrons from these outer shells, which have a very small energy, um, they can get enough energy to sort of break away from uh, their, their atom and sort of float around inside the lattice. And so we view metals as being a lattice of charged ions. And these ions are charged because the atoms have lost electrons. And so when an atom loses an electron, it gains a positive charge. So we have a lattice of metal ions with a sea of dissociated electrons sort of floating in between. Uh, and here I've shown uh, a picture of graphene and graphite. Um, these are not, well, we call them metals in condensed matter physics, but they're made out of carbon. Um, but they nevertheless uh, conduct electricity. And here you can clearly see a crystal lattice, a repeating pattern of how the carbon atoms are arranged. And sort of floating around in these lattices, you would see this sort of sea of dissociated electrons. Um, by the way, if you have any questions at any point, please interrupt me. Um, so when we apply a potential difference, you know, when we hook it up to a battery, then this causes an electric field to be formed inside of the material. Um, and as you remember from previous lectures, uh, when a charged particle is in an electric field, it accelerates, it moves, uh, it, it gains a velocity. And this movement of the electrons, this acceleration is what causes the uh, electric current. Uh, 
So now going back to Ohm's law, we had that the current depended on the voltage and the resistance. Now the voltage is just what we apply. It's, you know, however big the battery we're hooking up is, or if we're plugging into the wall socket, it's, you know, 110 volts. But what is the resistance? Why does copper conduct elect electricity very well, but, you know, sulfur does not? Why do certain materials conduct better than others? Uh, so these here are resistors, resistors that you'd see in the standard application. Um, and the resistance of a resistor is not just dependent on the type of material, but it's also dependent on the shape. Um, you can think if I make a very, very, very thin wire, then it's going to be hard for electrons to pass through a very thin area. Um, or if I have something that's really, really long, then electrons have to go really, really far. So you're going to get a really high resistance. Uh, but we can define a quantity called resistivity which is specific to a material. So you get resistivity specific to copper, specific to paper, specific to plastic. And the resistance of a resistor is related to this resistivity by you know, this equation. Uh, the longer it is, the greater the resistance, the bigger the cross-sectional area, the smaller the resistance. So now the question is, how do we find, where does this resistivity come from? For different material, why do different materials have different resistivity? So, uh, one of the very first theories to explain the behavior of solids was something called the Druda model. It was developed by a theoretical physicist named Paul Druda in 1900, and it is a classical theory. We think of electrons as being billiard balls that move through the lattice as this free gas of dissociated electrons. And every so often, they collide with, a, with some site on the lattice, some impurity, some defect in the crystal. And when they collide, they are deflected off in some random direction. Now, uh, the sum of 10 to the power 23 random momentum vectors is zero. So on average, we basically think that when the electron is scattered, its velocity is set to zero. Um, and then after its velocity is set to zero, then again, because I'm applying a potential difference, there'll be an electric field that accelerates it until it hits another, and then it'll be scattered and then it'll accelerate and then hit another, and then it'll accelerate and scatter again, and so on and so forth. So we can think of it as sort of a pinball machine, but where the ball sort of has a tendency to go in one direction. And we assume that there is an average time tau between these collisions that we call a relaxation time. Now you can think that the shorter tau is, the more frequently electrons are being pushed around, the more frequently they're getting scattered and their velocity is set to zero. And so the resistivity will be greater. And if you do all of the mathematics uh, of this model, you find this equation for the resistivity, where the resistivity is um, inversely proportional to the uh, relaxation time, which what this says is that if the relaxation time is small, which means that your electrons are scattering very, very often, then the resistivity will be very big, exactly as we expect. Um, it is directly proportional to the mass. Why? If electrons are heavier, they're going to be more sluggish. They're not going to want to move. Um, and it is inversely proportional to how many uh, carriers there are. If there are only a few electrons inside of my metal, then um, you know, there's not going to be that many to carry the current. Whereas if there are more electrons, there are going to be more carriers. So what this tells us is that the more carriers there are, the lower the resistivity. Um, does that make sense so far? Um, OK. so. The Druda model is a very crude model. 
electrons are not billiard balls. We know that we have to describe electrons by uh, quantum mechanics. We have to describe them by wave functions. Nevertheless, Druda theory actually works really, really well. Um, in our department, we get papers published every month that uh, tell you the relaxation time of a particular material um, using this sort of billiard ball model that you know we know is not is not really right. It's not quantum mechanical. So how does Druda theory work so well? Uh, it works really well because of something called Bloch's theorem, which is that um, the wave functions of electrons on a crystal lattice kind of just look like sine curves. Uh, and sine curves are um, the uh, wave functions of free electrons. So we can kind of consider these electrons, they quantum mechanically sort of behave like free electrons. And free electrons, then we can think of as being billiard balls. So um, yeah, it's a surprisingly powerful theory. Um, now, you'll notice in all the slides previously, I wrote charge carriers. Why do I say charge carriers and not electrons? Well, turns out that there's something called the Hall effect. And you can, and the Hall effect tells you, you can use the Hall effect to find out, well, how many carriers there are inside a material, but also you can use it to tell how many charges there are inside of the material. Uh, uh, how many, sorry, what sign the charges have inside of the material. And you do the Hall effect on measurements on iron, you do it on copper, and you find that, you know, your charge carriers are negative, they have the charge of an electron. But then you do it on aluminium, and you get the shock of your life, because you find that the charge carriers are positive in charge. Now, normally we think that it's electrons moving through the material, but electrons have a negative charge. Uh, so what could it be that has a positive charge? Well, it could be antimatter, but that's incredibly unlikely. Um, so it has to be something else. And those are called holes. And I will get to that in, in a little bit. Um, so now we make a segue into what we call band theory. So you know that the energies of electrons inside atoms are uh, only allowed in specific energy levels, specific shells. Um, similarly, the energies of electrons inside materials are allowed inside certain bands. So you can find an electron with an energy somewhere in this band, but you will never find an electron with an energy inside a gap. Um, and this here, sorry, this here is a diagram of the band structure of germanium. So you can take a look at sort of all of these energies are allowed, but then there's this gap over here. No electrons can have an energy that is inside of this gap. Um, why is this the case? Uh, and bands not only give us a relation, give us the allowed energies, but they give us a relationship between momentum and energy. At the end of the day, these electrons are moving. Or, hello. Uh, sorry, was did anybody have a question? Uh, okay, yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, these electrons are sort of moving around inside of the crystal. Um, as we said earlier, they were nearly free. Um, so, uh, normally there's a relationship between energy and momentum. Um, normally, you know, for any, in a particle just out in outer space, you're going to have that the kinetic energy is going to be half mv squared, which is, you know, the momentum squared over 2m. So, uh, the bands inside a material, we get a lot more exotic relationships between momentum and energy, and the band theory describes that. So why do we get bands? Well, again, think of quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, particles behave both like particles and waves. Um, and if I have a 
an electron moving with a certain momentum p, then it's going to be a wave with a wavelength given by what we call the de Broglie, de Broglie wavelength, uh, where the faster it's moving, the higher the momentum, the shorter the wavelength. Um, so now think of a crystal lattice. Think of a crystal, just a one-dimensional crystal, where I have a bunch of atoms separated from each other by a distance a. And then I can think of having wave functions. The electrons are just being waves on this, on this lattice. One way of thinking about this is that when I actually make a measurement, I'm actually going to see that the electron is going to be bound to some atom. So what really matters is the value of the wave at the site of each atom. So consider this. I have drawn here two, two curves, two wave functions, and a bunch of atomic sites. Now these two, wave, these two waves very clearly have a different, uh, a, a different wavelength. You know, this one, the wavelength is about that big. Whereas this one, the wavelength is about that big. So they're clearly two different waves. However, the value of the wave function at each site, at this atom, this one's positive. At this atom, they're both negative. At this atom, they're both positive. At this atom, they're both negative. At each lattice point, both of these waves, both of these electrons are exactly the same which means that these waves must be equivalent to each other. The difference between these two waves, the difference between their de Broglie wavelengths, actually, if you do the math, uh, there's something called Nyquist's theorem. Uh, you don't need to know what that is. But um, they differ by a momentum of h over a. h here, by the way, I'm sorry, H is the, uh, the Planck constant that I think you discussed earlier. Furthermore, if I take another wave where I add a bit of momentum of H over A, that too will look the same. So if I take any particle and I add to it um, a, video, a little bit of momentum H over A, I get the exact same thing, which means that momentum can only be defined between zero and h over a, uh, which we call modulo. So adding modulo kind of means uh, adding on a clock. If it's seven o'clock and then I add, you know, eight hours to that, it's not going to be 15 on the clock, it's going to be three. Um, similarly, so it kind of wraps back. Similarly, momenta inside of a a uh, crystal wrap back. If I keep going and going and going, it's going to wrap back and all momenta will only be defined within an amount h over a. Uh, does that make sense? Um, okay, so for a free particle, a particle without any electric fields or magnetic fields, just a particle out in outer space doing its own thing, um, the energy is just the kinetic energy, half mv square, which we can write as p squared divided by 2m by substituting p is equal to mv. Uh, and that is a parabola. It's a quadratic equation. Um, now, if we consider that parabola, but we consider the momentum as sort of going back into itself, as I described, then what's going to happen is it's going to be a parabola, but it's going to fold back. It's going to fold back into themselves because the momentum over here corresponds to a momentum over here. And similarly, something over here corresponds to something over here. So it folds back. And so the same momentum can actually correspond to many different energies inside of the crystal. Uh, now, thing is, the electrons aren't actually free. The energy isn't just the kinetic energy, p squared over 2m. There's also going to be a potential caused by the background of ions uh, inside the material. 
But this potential is going to be periodic. And the reason it's periodic is because if I shift over an amount A, I get back to the exact same point as I was earlier. Um, you know, moving over in a crystal lattice, it looks exactly the same. If I walk from here to here and I look around me, I cannot tell the difference. So this potential is going to be, is going to also be periodic in the, uh, with periodicity, the same as the crystal lattice. Uh, turns out when you solve for the quantum mechanics of a periodic potential, um, it opens up gaps. So previously I had a folded parabola. Now it turns out it distorts the parabola and it opens up gaps on the edges and it changes around the structure. So I can get exotic structures like this one for germanium. Um, now, electrons are fermions. Uh, I think you might have discussed this earlier. There are two types of particles out there in nature. There are fermions and bosons. Uh, fermions obey what we call the Pauli exclusion principle, which tells you that no two fermions can occupy the same state. You cannot have two electrons with the same energy and same momentum. You can't have two fermions in the same place. Bosons, on the other hand, can. So one way we like to think of this is that bosons like to stack up on top of each other, whereas fermions like to stay away from each other. Uh, and because fermions like to stay away from each other, um, they obey a certain special type of behavior uh, with temperature. So what temperature is, is temperature is essentially just kind of a measure of energy in your system. Um, the lower the temperature, the lower the energy of all of, your, uh, all of your electrons. If I had bosons, then they would just all sort of go to zero energy. But because fermions obey Pauli exclusion, some of them will be at low energy, and then some of them will have to be at a little high energy, and some of them will have to be a little higher energy um, until they occupy some energy called until some energy where everything below it is filled called the Fermi energy. As temperature increases, sort of the randomness of the motion of the electrons increases. And some electrons are then able to go past the Fermi energy and occupy higher energy states. So the occupation of energy states spreads out at higher temperatures. Um, so this is what gives us the difference between an insulator and a metal. In an insulator, going back to this band gap that we had talked about earlier, this region where no, no energies are allowed, no electrons can possess energies within here. If the Fermi energy, the maximum possible energy that an electron can hold at zero temperature, cuts it is inside a band gap then the material is an insulator whereas if it cuts through a band then it is a metal and the reason for this is very clear from the next diagram when your fermi energy cuts through a band then there are momentum states in the band just above that energy that are not occupied then when I hook up my material to a battery and I cause a potential difference across it, then I'm sort of preferencing electrons to move in one direction. And they will kind of creep up the band in one direction and creep down. Um, and so you get more electrons with a momentum in one direction than with another. And so more electrons will move in one direction than moving in the other direction. And so you get a current. Whereas in an insulator, there's nowhere for it to go. Um, if, it, if an electron here tries to increase its, its momentum, it's just going to wrap back. And so you can't get a net movement of electrons. And so you cannot get a current. 
Um, now, there is a very special type of materials called semiconductors. What semiconductors are, are they're a special type, a very special type of insulator that have a very, very small band gap. And the Fermi energy lies inside this very, very small band gap. Now, when you heat up anything, you're putting energy into it. And, you know, again, temperature is kind of a measure of average energy. So at high temperatures, some electrons in this band, in this valence band, um, will be able to excite the thermal, the heat itself will be able to push them up into the conduction band. And now they're able to access whatever momentum states they like. Um, and this creates, you know, excited electrons that can then move around, but it also creates an absence of electrons where these states previously had electrons in them inside the lower band, the valence band. Now there isn't an electron. Um, not having an electron is kind of similar to putting in a positive charge into this band. And so we think of these uh, absences of electrons as being their own particle that we call a hole. And this is something that we do in physics all the time. Uh, there are particles that don't actually exist. They're not really in particle physics. But you get these things that mathematically behave like particles, uh, like these holes that we call quasi-particles. And these are very, very important. And I'll talk about them a little bit more later. But anyway, in a semiconductor, as the temperature increases, these electrons are promoted to a higher band, and now they're free to move around. And now your material can conduct electricity. So um, this is really important. Uh, if you remember, again, uh, the Druda model, what we found for the resistivity of a material it was inversely proportional to the number of carriers. The more carriers, the better the thing conducts. Now, with an increase in temperature, more and more electrons are getting promoted to the upper band. This N is going to increase. And so the resistivity is going to fall with temperature. This is the exact opposite behavior than we expect from a metal. With a metal, an increase in temperature will cause the resistivity to rise. And the reason for this is going back to the Druda model. At high temperature, everything's vibrating. And so because everything's vibrating, things are going to collide with each other more. On average, it'll take less time for a charge carrier to be scattered. So an increase in temperature will cause this relaxation time to go down and the resistivity to increase. So inside a metal, heating up a metal, if I take a piece of copper and I put it on the stove, its resistance will increase. But a semiconductor has the exact opposite behavior. Now, we can do what we call doping to a semiconductor, where we introduce impurities into the lattice. Now, these, thing for two oh, um, these impurities um, can either have more electrons than the atoms inside of the lattice, or they can have fewer. Here, for example, we have a silicon semiconductor that is doped with phosphorus. And because phosphorus has one extra electron, if you look at the periodic table, it sort of donates another electron to the lattice whereas boron has one fewer. So it kind of absorbs an electron or donates a hole to the lattice. Um, and so a P-type semiconductor is one in which holes have been added. And an N-type semiconductor is one in which electrons have been added. And we can take a P-type semiconductor and an N-type semiconductor, and we can put them together to make something called a PN junction. Uh, what a PN junction does is it only allows an electric current to flow in one direction. So electric current will flow from here to here, but it will not flow in the opposite direction. 
uh, and that's called a diode. We can use that to make a diode, which again, allows electricity to flow one way, but not the other. Uh, you can think of it as being kind of a valve for electric current. Uh, and you can use these diodes to build uh, logic gates. Um, and then you can use logic gates to build chips and you can use chips to build computers. So this is the physics of how, of the whole semiconductor revolution and how now semiconductors and electric chips and diodes are ubiquitous in our everyday life. And that is how I'm now teaching you over Zoom. Uh, photovoltaic cells can be made out of semiconductors. So going back over here, electrons are promoted to the upper band where they can now move by thermal fluctuations. Instead, I know that photons, um, little packets of light, carry energy. And so I can have a photon coming in and an electron absorbs that energy and that promotes it up. And then that can cause a current. And that is how solar cells work. Um, light comes in, promotes electrons, and then those electrons then uh, create an electric current and uh, dissipate energy through your circuit, power your light bulb, your microwave, your TV, all of that stuff. Um, now, uh, for a free electron, the energy is just the kinetic energy, half mv squared, or p squared over 2m. So the mass here, so here what I've done is I've sort of plotted the energy versus the momentum for a bunch of different particles. This is just p squared over 2m. It's just a parabola, but with a bunch of different masses. So this one has mass 1, this one has mass 2, this one has mass 4. And you can see that as the mass falls, the parabola becomes curvier. It becomes sharper. So what mass really is, what, what we can think of it as being, is sort of a, a measurement of how curvy, how sharp my energy momentum relationship is. So now, if we look at different bands, um, I can make these bands very sharp. In certain materials, it'll be very sharp. In certain materials, it'll be very broad. And so the effective mass of the electron or of the hole inside of your band will be different. Like the way it'll behave as if it has either a very large or a very small mass, even though we know that electrons have, you know, a definite mass. Um, and this is the energy, the band structure of a material called graphene. Graphene is now everywhere. Everybody is studying it. It's a, a one dimensional layer of carbon atoms. And inside graphene, the Fermi level cuts through a point where two bands intersect. And if you take a look over here, you essentially have a kink in the energy momentum relationship. So this kink is just, you can think of it as being a very, very, very sharp parabola. Um, a very, very, very curvy parabola. And we see that as the mass goes down, um, the curviness increases, which means that over here, the mass is really, really, really low. So inside graphene, electrons behave as if they have no mass. And waves that have no mass are light waves. So electrons behave like light inside of graphene. Um, so this is one of the beauties of solid state physics is that we can tinker with nature. I can make an electron behave infinitely massive. I can also make it behave like light. So it's cool physics. Um, so now I'm gonna segue a little bit uh, from semiconductor physics to magnetism. So, you know, we see magnets all around us. We have fridge magnets and magnets are used inside of our iPhones and everything. Uh, where does 
what are permanent magnets? You learned earlier about electromagnets, but what, what are fridge magnets? Well, permanent magnets come about because electrons have something called spin, which I believe uh, you learned earlier, where you can think of spin as sort of being a little arrow that electrons carry about with them. Um, now, this arrow can either point up or it can point down, and each of these spins itself acts as a tiny little magnet. It itself has a tiny little magnetic moment. Uh, if you remember, a coil of wire has a magnetic field associated with it. You can kind of think of each of these spins as being like a little coil of wire with a current going through it. Um, kind of, not exactly. So there are many different types of magnets. Uh, materials around us have their magnetic properties in certain ways. So there are paramagnets, where the spins sort of point in random directions, and uh, they're, they're you know, in flux, they're moving about. Most materials at high temperatures are paramagnets. And the reason for this is because of something called entropy. Um, Entropy is essentially a measure of randomness. How much randomness is there inside of a material? And in general, increasing the temperature of anything increases its entropy. And here, with all of these things sort of pointing in random directions, I guess for some reason the animation doesn't make this look very random, but they should be random. Uh, you know, that, that increases entropy. And the sum of, you know, 10 to the power 23 random vectors is zero. So this has no net magnetism. So just a normal bar of iron is a paramagnet. However, if I cool down a bar of iron, then it will spontaneously become a magnet like a fridge magnet. And all of the spins will point in the same direction. And sort of all of these spins sort of reinforce themselves and you get one big arrow, one big magnetic moment. Um, and this is not random. If I know which direction a spin is pointing, I know the direction its neighbors are pointing in. So this has low entropy. So at low temperatures, this is the kind of thing that you will see. Another possibility is what we call an antiferromagnet, where spins anti-align. Uh, so they, they uh, alternate between pointing up and pointing down. Now the sum of all of these vectors is zero. So an, anti, so an antiferromagnet does not have any net magnetic moment, but it's nevertheless ordered. This is not random at all. This is low entropy. Turns out that most of the materials that we see in nature are antiferromagnets. And the reason for this is that most metals are bonded to either you know, oxygen or to sulfur or to chlorine or fluorine. Um, and these elements uh, do something called super exchange, where the fact that they are bonded to oxygen or halides or sulfur uh, makes neighboring iron atoms or neighboring whatever atoms want to anti-align. So most materials out there are antiferromagnets. Then there are also some very exotic kinds of magnets. There's what's called a heli magnet. A heli magnet occurs when you have a competition between ferromagnet and antiferromagnet. Your system sort of simultaneously wants to be both an antiferromagnet and a ferromagnet. And so we get the spins sort of, they align with each other in certain places, but they also rotate and therefore anti-align on some, in some ways. You'll notice, you know, a plane back here would perfectly anti-align with this plane. So also you get no net moment, but these are very rare and they only occur normally at like one or two Kelvin, very, very low temperatures. Um, and they're very exotic. There's something called a Ferry magnet. Um, so the first magnets that mankind ever discovered, you know, the, some of the first, um, some of the first, uh, Measurements of magnetism were done by the ancient Greeks. They noted that if you took lodestones made out of magnetite, magnetite is Fe3O4, 
iron oxide. Uh, they point, they align with the Earth's field, but if you put it in a fire, it stopped aligning with the Earth's field. A uh, magnetite is a fairy magnet where spins anti-align, but some of the spins are stronger than the other. So this leads to a weak but net moment in one direction. But if I put it in the fire and I heat it up, everything is going to become random. The entropy is going to increase and it's just going to become a paramagnet again. So yeah, this is just that statement. Again, entropy is randomness. At high temperatures, most materials are paramagnets in order to maximize this randomness, in order to maximize this entropy. But below some critical temperature, these materials generally order into one of these types. Um, and this ordering leads to a fall in entropy. So uh, this is a plot from uh, one of my papers. Um, it's uh, about a material called barium iron selenide. Barium iron selenide is an anti-ferromagnet uh, that has a very special kind of structure. And this over here is a plot of the square of the magnetic moment. Uh, why the square of the magnetic moment? Well, because you, it's an anti-ferromagnet, so you have like up and down and up and down. So if you square it, everything will be positive. Um, and this is the fraction of the material that is an anti-ferromagnet. And you can see that there's a temperature above which it's just zero, above which it's a paramagnet. But below that temperature, all of a sudden, the whole material is antiferromagnetic. All of a sudden, the moment is huge. Uh, so this is what we call a phase transition. Um, going from sort of this state of high entropy, then decreasing the temperature, and all of a sudden going to the state of lower entropy, going from a paramagnet to an antiferromagnet. Um, there are other sort of very exotic types of magnet. So there's something we call a spin glass. So glass, uh, this, is, this here is glass, is what we call an amorphous material. It is not a crystal. Um, the glass molecules, you know, the silicon and oxygen atoms are sort of placed kind of randomly. Uh, and the bonds are kind of haphazard. Uh, whereas quartz, has a beautiful crystalline structure. Everything is nice and ordered. Um, and you can see uh, the relevance of these behaviors when you actually pick up glass. If you go to your kitchen and you have you know, a fancy crystal glass, glass, there the glass is a crystal. If you hit a crystal glass with a spoon, uh, then it'll get a nice ringing sound that'll last a while. Whereas if you hit a cheap glass with a spoon, it'll have a sound that is, you know, it doesn't last as long, it's not as pretty. Uh, that is related to the fact that it was related to the crystalline structure. So what happens in glass is if I cool down glass, it'll form a solid, but it'll form sort of a kind of a random solid. Similarly, in a spin glass, when I cool it down, the spins are going to freeze in some orientation, but kind of randomly. Um, and these are really, really interesting. Because if you think about it, there's only one way to make a crystal. But there are many, many, many ways of making an amorphous substance. There are many, many different possible. This is only one structure. But this is a very, very large number of possible random structures. Similarly, a spin glass, you know, if I think of it quantum mechanically, normally when I cool something down, it'll go into one quantum state that we call a ground state. Whereas here, there are many different possible ground states that are all kind of different from each other, yet have some similarities. So spin glasses are really cool, and we study them a lot. So this is sort of a comparison of a spin glass to a fer ferromagnet, where a ferromagnet, everything is pointing in the same direction, everything's ordered spin glass, things are sort of more random. There's something called a spin liquid, uh, which spin liquids never order. So here we saw this material, it was a paramagnet, and then all of a sudden it became an antiferromagnet. Uh, spin liquids, no matter how cold you get, will never order. Now the thing is, we've never actually seen a spin liquid, but we've seen materials that are very, very close. Um, and spin liquids arise due to what we call frustration, magnetic frustration. 
What is frustration? So think of this triangle. I have three spins on a triangle. And I have, and this material wants to be an anti-ferromagnet. It wants to be that neighboring spins anti-align with each other. So think if this one points up, well, then this one wants to anti-align, so it'll point down. But then what does this guy do? If it anti-aligns with this one, it will align with this one. If it aligns, if it anti-aligns with this one, it'll align with this one. There is no way for it to anti-align with both of them. That is what we call frust that is what we call frustration. Uh, it's a frustrated magnet. Um, and that's why it's never able to order, because it's just always frustrated. Um, spin liquids have possible applications in quantum computing. Uh, in quantum computing, we want to have materials that don't have a magnetic field, that don't have a magnetic moment, even at very low temperatures. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, so spin liquids could be able to allow us to do that. Uh, and we are still actively searching for these. Uh, I study a couple different spin liquid materials, for example, in my research. Um, so now back to sort of uh, practical application of, of solid state physics. Uh, what are the So we saw the practical applications of band theory and semiconductors. Uh, what are the practical applications of magnetism and magnetic ordering? Well, one of them is in magnetic storage. Inside of your computer, your hard disk stores information magnetically. So uh, information in your computer is stored as a long string of binary, a long string of ones and zeros, essentially. Uh, so how are those ones and zeros saved? Well, you have a hard disk that is split up into a bunch of tiny little ferromagnetic domains. A bunch of tiny, it's split up into a bunch of tiny little magnets. And these magnets can either point up or down. And depending on whether they point up or down, it'll be a one or a zero. And you have a head that will scan over every one of these domains, every one of these bits, and find out whether it's a one or a zero. And that is how you store information. Thing is, if I take a hard drive and I apply a very, very, very strong magnetic field to it, but let's say I just take a kitchen magnet and I put it next to my computer, there is a possibility of corruption. There's a possibility that the field will cause a one to flip to a zero, or maybe a zero to flip to a one. Or if I increase the temperature, as I saw earlier, increasing the temperature leads ferromagnets to become paramagnets. If I increase the temperature, this might also lose the information. So how can I make a hard disk that is robust against external magnetic fields, temperature, and also neighboring fields? These these spins are going to want to try to make this one um, flip. So how do you do that? Well, um, how these uh, bits are going to respond to an external field depends on something called a magnetization curve. Magnetization tells you the, mag the magnetic moment of your material and how it changes with an external field. All of you know that you know, you've done this when you were young. If you take a paper clip and you stroke it with a magnet, then it itself will become a magnet. So what will happen is, you know, you're applying a magnetic force, a magnetic field outside, and that causes the magnetism of the material itself to increase. Um, so how the uh, material responds to an external field is given by you know, th this curve. And this curve looks different going one way than going the other. That's what we call hysteresis. Oh, hysteresis means history effects. Um, going one way will be different going a diff than going the other way because of the history of how that modulation of the field works, how that changing of the field works. There's something called exchange bias, and uh, this is what I'm actually researching right now, um, which is a shift of a magnetization curve 
uh, from being centered sort of at a zero field to being centered in a non-zero field. And this is what is used inside of your computer. It is exchange bias that makes the bits inside of your computer robust. How does it do so? I can shift, say, a one to a point here and say a zero to like a point over here. So because this is centered around here, it will require a big field to then flip that back. It will require a big field to go from here to here, to go from the magnetization pointing up to the magnetization pointing down. Um, or for in the opposite way, it'll require a big field to flip it from going the field pointing down to the field going up. So knowledge of magnetism inside materials has very big applications. Um, and this leads us to what we call spintronics. How can we make this better? Well, one thing that's being researched in our department is using antiferromagnets to make magnetic memory instead. You know, ferromagnets have a net moment. And so one ferromagnet will be influenced by the ferromagnet right next to it. And if I apply a field, they'll try to sort of cant in the direction of that field. Whereas for an antiferromagnet, antiferromagnets, because all of these cancel each other, don't have a net field. And so they won't be affected by an external magnet, nor will they be affected by the bit next to it. But I can distinguish between a one or a zero by making my antiferromagnets aligned, say, in one direction, say, vertically or horizontally, instead of having, you know, a field pointing up or down. Um, and that would lead to very, very robust um, hard disks that can survive to very high temperatures, very high external fields, so on and so forth. And this is an active area of study. Another thing that we're studying is even cooler. It's something called skirmions. So what skirmions are, is they're a particle uh, that may or may, not, may or may not exist in nature that were first theorized by particle theorists, by high energy physicists, really smart people who do a lot of math. Um, and these particles are sort of particles that obey certain kinds of topological behavior. Uh, I, I won't really explain what that means, but um, they also come up a lot in string theory. Now the thing is we've never really seen a skirmion outside of nature. But inside of a semiconductor, you can make a spin arrangement, sort of a vortex, a knot of spins that actually behaves, this entire thing as a whole behaves like one particle. It behaves like a skirmion, this sort of fictitious particle that particle physicists um, theorized. This is another example of quasi-particles. Previously, I told you that holes don't actually exist. They're the absence of an electron. But it makes sense to treat them like a particle because they behave like one. Similarly, skirmions are nothing but an exotic spin arrangement. But they, too, behave like a particle. And the beautiful thing about skirmions is you can move them around very easily. Applying an electric field causes them to move around. They're also very robust. Once you make a skirmion, it's very hard to unmake it. So there are attempts to make a computer where uh, a one is sort of the existence of a skirmion and a zero is the non-existence of a skirmion. And I can have a head just like my hard disk and the head, and now I have a current passing through and the head is stationary and, um, the head will be able to tell whether it saw a skirmion or not, and therefore whether it was a one or a zero. And you can store information that way. So this is what we call spintronics. Um, and it uses sort of fundamental physics to make real life electronics. Um, so yeah, uh, that, that, that's really interesting to me. Um, now on to a different area. Uh, this is my primary area of research, uh, and this is one of the biggest, biggest open questions in all of physics, one of the most interesting areas in physics, uh, superconductors. So there is a man named uh, Haiki Onis who uh, 
he perfected the art of cooling things down. Back in the beginning of the 1900s, he made some truly incredible uh, refrigerators. And he was able to cool things down to only a couple Kelvin, you know, negative 270 degrees centigrade. Um, and he didn't really expect what to see there, but he thought, you know, I might as well just, you know, cool some things down and see what happens. And he cooled down liquid mercury. And when he cooled it down, what he saw was that all of a sudden the, res the resistivity went to zero. It had zero resistance. Um, if you think of that in terms of sort of the, the billiard ball model, the Druda model we were talking about earlier, this would mean sort of an infinite relaxation time. How can that possibly happen? If resistivity is zero, that also means that there's no power dissipation. I can, um, you know, I can uh, transmit power without losing any energy. Inside of our power grid, something like 25% of the electricity that is generated from, you know, burning coal or reacting uranium at your local power plant is lost uh, due to the resistivity of the wires that carry it. But for example, in Seoul, South Korea, uh, the main power line is actually made of a, of a superconductor and it does not lose any energy. Um, the magnets in the Large Hadron Collider or the magnets inside of MRI machines when you're getting an MRI scan of your body require an incredible amount of electric current. Um, a normal metal would simply melt uh, because that much current would lead to a lot of energy and a lot of energy will lead to higher temperature and it'll melt. But a superconductor can handle it just fine. But superconductors only work at incredibly low temperatures. Heike Onis saw this in liquid mercury at 4.2 Kelvin. Very, very, very low temperatures, very close to absolute zero. And this is a graph of um, the temperatures, the critical temperatures at which certain materials begin to superconduct uh, and the years that they were discovered. And as you can see, uh, as time goes by, we're discovering higher and higher temperature superconductors. Um, but still, we're not, I mean, 150 Kelvin is still very, very, very cold. Um, and this is why you don't see superconductors everywhere. This is why your iPhone does not have superconductors inside of it, because cooling things down is expensive. Um, and sort of the threshold temperature here is 77 Kelvin, because 77 Kelvin is the temperature of liquid nitrogen. And you can buy liquid nitrogen in a store. Um, it's cheap. If you can cool things down with liquid nitrogen, that's cheap. Lower temperatures, you need liquid helium. Liquid helium is very, very, very expensive. Uh, so MRI machines use uh, these YBCOs, yttrium barium copper oxide, in order to uh, that work at liquid nitrogen temperatures um, in order to superconduct. Uh, another interesting property of superconductors is something we call the Meissner effect. Superconductors um, shield magnetic fields. So here what we have is we have a superconducting sample and we have a magnet. Um, and initially when you place them, now the superconducting sample initially is at room temperature. So it isn't superconducting because it's hot. And you see that when you put the magnet on top of it, nothing happens. But now we apply some liquid nitrogen and we cool down the superconductor. And as it cools down, it begins to superconduct. And now when you put the magnet on top of it, it floats. The reason that it floats is because magnetic fields are not allowed inside of a superconductor. So if you were to try to push down the magnet, you know, gravity is trying to pull down the magnet. You can think of it as kind of, you know, trying to push that field into the superconductor and it doesn't like that, so it hovers. Uh, and the Meissner effect has a lot of applications. We can make magnetic levitation trains out of this. Think about making the track out of superconductors and making the bottom of the track out of magnets.
Uh, you can create sort of magnetic shields to shield things from magnetic fields because there's no magnetic field inside of the superconductor and so on and so forth. Uh, now you see as the superconductor is pulled out of the liquid nitrogen and it heats up again, it stops being superconducting um, at higher temperatures and the Meissner effect goes away. Um, so yeah, there are many ways of thinking about why this happens. Um, a basic treatment, hello, yes? Was there a question? I don't think so. Okay, anyway, sorry, my bad. Um, so generally, if you solve sort of uh, the equations of electromagnetism, having um, no resistivity requires no magnetic field inside. Another way to think of it is uh, if you do what's called quantum field theory, there's something called the Higgs-Anderson mechanism. Um, this is a very similar mechanism to how the Higgs boson works. And by the Higgs-Anderson mechanism, when uh, photons enter inside of a superconductor, they gain mass. So this is sort of another instance of like those weird quasi-particles we're talking about. You know, all of a sudden we have massless electrons. Now all of a sudden we have light that has mass. And that mass causes it to sort of decay on some length and therefore the magnetic field decays inside of the superconductor and there's no magnetic field. So why, it, why are superconductors interesting? Obviously there are all of these possible technological and economic applications, but I mean, that's not why we study them. Physicists don't study things because they can be used in technology. We study them because they're cool. Um, and the theory explaining uh, superconductors is what's called BCS theory, Bardeen, Cooper, Schrieffer theory. Uh, John Bardeen, the guy who invented this, won two Nobel prizes in physics. The first Nobel prize was for discovering band theory. The second Nobel prize was for discovering BCS theory. He is one of the most illustrious physicists in all of history and probably the physicist with the most technological impact in all of history. Anyway. Um, so the reason that electrons, uh, the reason that materials have resistivity, if we go back here, um, it was because, uh, electrons, uh, obey what's called Pauli exclusion and they fill up bands and they have to sort of go into higher momentum states in order to, um, conduct electricity. Uh, whereas bosons, do not care about um, Pauli exclusion. Bosons, you can have multiple different bosons occupying the same state. So it's possible that inside of, if, if electrons are bosons, they would all just sort of occupy the lowest energy and therefore they could all freely move about. Um, so what uh, BCS theory is, is two electrons come together and form a new kind of quasi-particle called a Cooper pair. And this Cooper pair behaves like a boson. And because bosons are able to stack on top of each other, when they're moving through the lattice, there's sort of no traffic jam of electrons. You know, because, because electrons are fermions and they obey Pauli exclusion, um, they can't be in the same place. So there's sort of a pile up, a traffic jam of electrons in your lattice. And that is what leads to resistivity. Whereas because bosons are able to be in the same place at the same time, think of just driving through the car in front of you. Uh, there's not going to be any more resistivity inside of the material. Now for electrons to come together to form a pair, there has to be something that holds them together. Now, electrons normally repel each other. They're negatively charged, like charges repel. So what is this glue that- Hey, Orny, uh, are, you, are you intending to show slides right now? Yes, I am. Can you not see uh, some? Yeah, we just, it's on the Meissner effect video still. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, can you see it now? Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, okay. So this was, sorry, back to Meissner effect, um, superconductors expel fields for various reasons, uh, Higgs-Anderson mechanism. Um, 
Anyways, the BCS theory, right? Electrons come together to form pairs. Um, what, what causes these electrons to glue to each other in order to form a pair and therefore behave like a boson and be able to stack up? Um, so BCS theory, the breakthrough of BCS theory is that uh, this glue is given by vibrations in the lattice. When an, when an electron moves through the lattice, it distorts the ions. It causes them to move. And that distortion sort of causes, think of like when you're in a boat and you're on sea, when you move, there are sort of ripples formed behind the boat. The boat leaves behind a trail in its wake. So similarly, as the electron moves, there are ripples in the lattice, and those ripples cause electrons to overcome their electric repulsion and come and glue together. Um, so this is what we call electron phonon coupling. Vibrations in a lattice, if you're, uh, I'm not sure you did this, but if you think of a string and I, and I fix a string at two ends, it can vibrate in certain ways. It can go up and down like this, or it can vibrate like this, or it can vibrate like this. There are many different modes, many different possible waves along the string. Similarly, vibrations in a crystal lattice can occupy many different modes. And these modes actually turn out, behave like bosons. They behave like particles. This is another example of quasi-particles, particles that don't actually exist per se, but there are things that come up in the mathematics that behave exactly like a particle. And vibrations in crystal lattices behave exactly like particles called phonons, just like light behaves like a particle called a photon. Um, so these vibrations in the crystal lattice these phonons, these electrons sort of pair and they couple, they interact with these phonons and that leads them to come together. Problem is at high temperatures, everything's vibrating. So you've got a lot of these phonons at very high energies and that sort of kills this. Um, at high temperatures, because everything's vibrating so much, this sort of pairing glue no longer holds. And that's why BCS theory does not work at higher temperatures. It doesn't work above temperatures like 20 Kelvin. But then I showed you a little while back, here we have high temperature superconductors at work above liquid nitrogen temperatures. I work at 100, 150 Kelvin. How do those work? The answer is we don't know. How high temperature superconductors work is one of the single biggest open questions in physics. We don't have a theory. We don't know. There are a lot of clues. Most high temperature superconductors have certain common behavior and we have reason to think that it's those common behaviors that lead to the superconductivity. Um, and my research group, that's one of the main things that we study, but we really don't know. And we're still sort of poking at it um, in the dark. Uh, so this is sort of my last slide. Um, Solid state physics is interesting and solids are interesting because they're sandboxes. We can tinker with physics. We see so many different possible physical effects inside of them. We can tweak the fundamental laws of nature. We can create new particles like photons, like, sorry, like phonons, like Cooper pairs, like all of these things that don't exist outside in, you know, in, in, inside of super collider experiments. Um, you know, skirmions, as I said earlier, there these things that have certain mathematical properties that particle physicists think might exist in nature, but we've never seen. But we see things, these spin configurations with those exact same properties inside of semiconductors. There's things called anions. You know, we talked about fermions and bosons, um, which have different properties. Turns out you can have a completely different type of thing called an anion, which behaves completely differently from the ways that fermions and bosons behave. Solids can be used as sandboxes to tinker with the fundamental assumptions of physics, to make new physics, and to learn more about physics, 
as well as to make the materials and the technologies of tomorrow. That is why we study them and that is why I love them. So thank you. I really hope you enjoyed uh, this presentation. Um, we have like five minutes if anybody has any questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Arnie. Round of applause. <laughs> Anyone have any questions for Orni? Not sure if you can see, but everyone's saying thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you everybody for listening. I, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you learned something and I hope you enjoyed this course. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing. Have I stopped sharing?